Ex so excited to have um, Mark Hunter here with us today. Um, I know we've been doing a lot of webinars, but this is one I've been really excited about. And as I mentioned earlier, Mark and I um, have known each other for many years. We've never done one of these partnerships, so it's well overdue. Um, but before we get started, I'd love to tell you a little bit about Mark. Um, Mark, AKA the sales hunter is recognized as one of the top 50 most influential sales and marketing leaders in the world. He is the author of not one, not two, but three best-selling books, high profit prospecting, high profit selling, and his newest book, which he will be going over today is a mind for sales. And guys, everyone should get a copy of that book. Cause I know he's going to give you guys a lot of tips and a lot of different strategies here today um, that he wrote in that book. So without further ado, Mark, I am stoked to have you on the show today. Hey, thank you for having me on. You know, I got some PowerPoint. I think I'm just going to talk. We're going to riff. We are going to get into it real quick. And people always ask me, hey, Mark, uh, what was the reason behind a mind for sales? Let me tell you why I wrote the book, A Mind for Sales. I wrote High Profit Prospecting. It was about how to prospect. And total full of, of uh, email scripts and, and voicemails and phone calls, all sorts of stuff in there. But people say, I'm scared. I'm scared. And that's why I wrote the book of Mind for Sales. Because really, sales is a head game. And it starts with your head. It starts with your head. And if you've had a chance to read the book, I tell the story in, in the front of the book how I got fired from my first two sales jobs. Sales was not what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to be a marketing person. But I wound up in sales only because I had too many speeding tickets. Now, nobody got hurt. Nobody, nobody died. You know. But anyway, but, but I couldn't afford a car. So that's why I wound up in a sales job because I needed a job that, was, that would supply me with a car. I got fired from my first two sales. What turned it around for me, what turned around for me was on my third sales job, third car. <laughs> the sales manager said, hey, do you really think you're making an impact with your customers? Do you really think you're making an impact with your customers? And uh, I had never looked at it that way before. I looked at customers as if they were bowling pins. My objective <laughs> was just to knock them down, take their money and run to the next one. And he began shifting my thinking. And it shifted my thinking to where I now realized why I was in sales. Now, Simon Sinek wrote the book, you know, why, you know, know your why. But I want to ask you yourself, why is it that you sell? Well, it, why we sell is because of the outcomes we create in other people. My definition of sales is pretty simple. It's to help others see and achieve what they didn't think was possible. That's it. That's what, that's what it's all about. Help others see and achieve what they didn't think was possible. Now, let's stop and back up for a second. Let, let, let's ask yourself this question. Who is it that you can help? And I'm going to share with you some very specific techniques right out of the book, A Mind for Sales, and some other techniques out of my book, High Profit Prospecting, here in just a second. And, and, and this first one really frames it up. Do you know the outcome that you help your customers achieve? You see, here's what, here's what I find. You, we've all heard the line, nobody wants to be sold. You're right, nobody wants to be sold. And I don't even think people want to buy, but they will invest. They will invest to solve an outcome to solve a problem, to help something. Yeah. So what I want you to do is I want you to stop and, 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 and think about this. You don't sell anything. You do not sell anything. What you, what you do is you help customers achieve solutions. That's what you help them do. And, and to make matters even worse or better, depending on how you look at it, you know, this morning when you woke up, there were over 1,000 people who needed what AutoClose has to offer. Or in the 1,000 people who needed what I have to offer. But you know what? They will never know unless I reach out to them. Unless I reach out to them. Yeah. You see, the power, and, and, and you know this very well, Sean. You know the power of prospecting. You know the power of getting in front of customers. Because customers don't know what they don't know. And yet too many salespeople, what they do is they want to sit here and play the rain barrel game. I don't know if you've ever seen a rain barrel. You know, that, that's the barrel that sits outside and just collects rainwater that falls directly overhead. Yeah. That's what, hey, I, I'd say it, but many of you out there, up until COVID, that was what you had for sales. You were just taking business that just boop, dropped in. Yep. What you have to be is you've got to be the rain maker. And, and is, I mean, that's kind of, what, what does auto clothes do? Auto clothes helps you be a rain maker, right? 
helps you close deals. It does. It helps because it allows you to get in front of more people. Now, let, 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 let's spin this around here because I want to share with you a couple concepts because when you signed up for this, you said, hey, Mark, you said you were going to go through like six different things. Let's go through them. Okay, here's the first one. C plus C equals C equals O equals P. This is not a math formula. Trust me, I made the upper half of my class possible. Some of you have to stop and think about that. Okay, I know, I know. It's a little bit hard. Okay, C plus C equals C equals O equals. What does this mean? This first C is continuity. Continuity. Your customer, you see, your reputation arrives before you do. I'll bet you money, none of you signed up for this webinar without first checking out, who's this Sean Finder guy? Who's this Mark Hunter guy? You probably went out and Googled, right? Right? You probably went out and Googled because our reputation arrives before we do. See, when you talk about prospect, when you talk about sales, that first C continuity is so important because what this means is that you've established yourself. You're out there. And, and this is why I also say that, you know, you can't expect to make one phone call. Well, gee, I called the prospect twice and they didn't, they didn't respond, so they must not be interested. Look, cowboy, you didn't have a conversation with them. I'm sorry, Sean, I'm getting a little animated. I just get out of control when I talk about this, okay? I'm with you, though. And, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, because just because they, they must not want to buy. No, you never had a conversation with them. Yeah. Continuity is about repetition. Here, here's something really cool. Some of the greatest words, some of the greatest advice you'll ever get is found in your shower. It's found in your shower. I want you to look at your shower bottle. I, I, or, excuse me, the bottle of shampoo that's in your shower. And there's a couple words on that bottle. Rinse and repeat. <laughs> wow. Think about that. That's what sales is. It's rinse and repeat. Yep. But here's something very interesting about rinse and repeat. It does not say, you know, put shampoo in your hair and rinse and then put the same shampoo back in your hair. It says different shampoo, right? right? You don't put the same shampoo back in your hair. You get fresh, fresh shampoo if there is such a thing. Same thing with your prospecting. Your prospecting must deliver a different message each time. This is the way you create this first C continuity. Okay, what's the second C? Second C is competence. That's you being seen as being smart, as being one of the smarter kids around. Now, how do you create competency? Competency is not necessarily with what you say, it's what the questions you ask. Yeah. You see, the questions you ask because they're industry specific, because they're, they're drilled down to what they're interested in. They're focused on them. You see, what you're doing is, is you demonstrate your competence through the homework that you've done before you've reached out to them. And now what you're doing is, is you are demonstrating. And, and oh, by the way, you know what's interesting? When you create competency, it's about asking questions that go beyond how's the weather, how are you doing in COVID? I mean, come on, people. I'm going to share with you in a bit called Three Level Deep. I'll get to that in a bit. But that's what that technique's all about. Yeah. But see, what, what I'm doing is, it, it, is I'm asking, which now gets us to the third C, C plus C equals C, confidence. Confidence. You see, at that point, now they're confident. They, the prospect is now, having conf, is now confident with you. And oh, by the way, you know what? you're confident with them. Yep. You see, what's, confidence goes two ways. And when, the two, when both people are confident, it's amazing the O, oh, opportunity yep. comes out. Boom. And see, I don't want to put any kind of a proposal on the table with you until I've reached that C plus C equals C. Because if I put, this is, this is why a lot of salespeople wind up having to discount. Because they put the price on the table too early. Just because the customer asks for a price does not mean you should give it to them. Uh-uh, uh-uh, no. You never put a price on the table until you've created a level of confidence. And I'll drill down more of that in just a bit when we talk about separating prospects from suspects. But see now, what does this do? So I got this opportunity, which then leads me to P, which is, okay, the polite way, potential. My way, profit. Profit. It's called making money. And what happens is profit cuts both ways. You see, don't ever be ashamed at the price you charge. Don't ever be ashamed because it's all relative to the value you create for the customer. And oh, by the way, you charge a high price, that's totally fine. 
totally fine. You know what's very interesting is I can go to a store and I can buy something, we'll say, for just a dollar or two. And if it doesn't work, I throw it away. I, I could care less. I don't place much value in it. If I go to a store and spend $100 for something, I expect it to work. I, I want to get value out of it. And I'm going to view it totally differently. See, so C plus C equals C equals O equals P. We're moving through this fast, but I want to get to the next one. Separating suspects from prospects. Hey, guess what, cowboys? Probably half of the lead, oh, I don't know. I don't even want to say half. I want to say three quarters of the prospects you have aren't going anywhere and you are wasting your time. Now, let me kind of paraphrase this. I, I kind of start off with leads. They're just kind of names. Then they're prospects. I'm kind of having, trying to have a little bit of dialogue with them. Uh, then they turn into customers. So that's kind of the definition criteria I'm using here on this. Now, let me back up here for a second. Prospects. Just because somebody returns a phone call, just because somebody has a conversation with me does not make them a prospect. It means they have a heartbeat. I got a dog. My dog has got a heartbeat. My dog is not buying anything from me. Just not. It's just not. So what I got to do is I got to qualify. Now, here's the whole thing. My objective is to actually have fewer qualified prospects. Not more, fewer because I want to have fewer prospects that I can spend more time with. Because when I can spend more time with them, guess what? I am able to help them at a deeper level. So here's the key thing. Here's the key measurement. Now we can go through the whole BANT thing and there's all kinds of different things. Here's the criteria I look for. Has the customer shared with you a piece of proprietary information? Have they shared with you a piece of proprietary information? If they have it now, what, what is a piece of proprietary information? That means it's, it, it's an insight that they haven't shared publicly. It's an insight that's not known publicly. It's something about their business, something relative to them. Now think about this. They are not going to do that unless they've got a level of confidence with you. Yep. Well, because they don't trust you. They don't trust you. But now once they have, I'm moving you from suspect to prospect. And now I move into the next piece on this list of things I said I was going to go through, and that is three level deep. Okay, now let's not kid ourselves. How many times, and if I'm talking too fast or if you need me to slow down, Sean, just say, put the brakes on it. I don't care. Go ahead and stop me anytime. But I get going and I just. No, I think, I think this is a lot of credit, guys. I just keep going, baby. Anyway, three. Ask some questions, guys, because at the end, we're going to answer your questions. So if you have yeah, any questions, yeah. So, yeah, start it. asking the questions. We're going to answer all your questions at the end, guys. Keep going, there Mark. Go. There I think go. everyone's Thank loving you. it. Oh, it's okay. I had to catch my breath. Anyway, three <laughs> level deep. How, you, you meet somebody new and you say, How are you doing? Well, what are they going to say? Fine. That, that is a bunch of crap. You see, the first time we ask somebody a question, they're not going to share with us their intimate pain. No, they're not. See, that's the top level. That's the top level. What I need to do is I need to get three levels down before I really get to really good information. So what I want to do is I want to take, and this first piece of information that you share with me, okay, that's fine, but I can't do anything with it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a question on that. I'm going to ask you a question about that very specifically to get you to respond, to share more insights. It's at that point I'm at the second level down. But here's where I get to third level. Third level is when I now take what you shared with me hmm, and I run with it even deeper. You see, I got to get three levels down in your thinking. Now, you probably or maybe haven't even really thought about what that third level is down, if, you know, if you're a customer. But see, if I've taken the time to create the confidence with you, if I've taken the time to understand who you are, you know, and, and you have confidence in me, hmm, hmm, then we got a dialogue going. Then we got it. And what I want to do is I want to get three levels down. Three levels down is when I'm really truly understanding what are your critical needs. This is the way you stay out of having to discount. My first book was around how to, how to maximize your price. Mm -hmm. And it was all about getting down to this third level, all about getting down to that third level. And what I have found 
is too many salespeople, what they do is they try to speed the prospecting. Now, speed sells, I get it. But you don't run red lights. Running red lights is not good. It's not a safe practice. So what you want to do is you want to make sure, am I getting a level of confidence? You know, do I have this first C, continuity? Do I have this second C, competence? Do I have, have I created confidence? Now, is there the opportunity? You see what I'm doing? I'm going through each one of these lights, but what this allows me to do, it allows me to get down to that third level. And when I get down to that third level, it's amazing what happens. Now, here's what's cool. Because the next thing on, on that list here, it was ghost blocking. Oh, man, how many times have you had what you thought was a really good call? Wow, that, cust that customer is going to buy. I know that customer is going to buy from me. And we never hear from them again. They ghosted us. And man, it happens to all of us. Here's the deal. You allowed them to ghost you because you didn't engage them. One of the most efficient, effective techniques to prevent ghost blocking, pay attention. You take whatever it is that they shared with you on one of the preceding phone calls. Maybe you only had one phone call. Maybe you only had one phone call and they only shared with you one piece of information. What you do is you play that back to them in that voicemail you leave them. You play that back to them in the email that you leave them. You play that back very specifically. I'll give you an example. This morning, I was following up with a company I'm looking to do some work with, and we had to reschedule the phone call for today, Tuesday, because yet he, when he called last week and we set this, this thing up, he said, oh, I can't meet on Monday because I'll be at my kid's high school golf tournament. It's a fundraising event. So what was the first thing I what was the first thing I asked him when I got on the phone? Hey, how was golf yesterday? How'd that go for you? How'd it work? And you know what? He immediately responded. Yeah. Now, if he had ghosted me on that call, which he could have, he could have, I would have put in the voicemail, hey, wanted to follow back. But first of all, I really want to find out how was golf yesterday? You know what? Chances are he's going to respond. He's going to play it back. He's going to call me back. I put that in email. You see, what I want to do is I play back. The best way to prevent ghosting is by playing back to them exactly what they shared with you in a preceding conversation and asking them a question on it. And especially if you can make it personal, because for some reason, people really want to respond personally. I'll give you an example. Yesterday, I had a gentleman call me trying to sell me on some stuff. I've known the guy. I've known the guy for a number of years. Eh, kind of lukewarm. And I hung up the phone call. And sure enough, a couple hours later, he left me a voicemail. Good salesperson. Good salesperson. I had one conversation, called me back a couple hours later. He got my voicemail, left me, and, and then asked me a little bit of a personal question. And you know what? Dog on it. I send him back a text. I said, hey, I'll, I'll be following up with you. Might not be until Thursday, but I'll be following up with you. Yeah, because he engaged me. He engaged me. Now, do I know him well? I know him. I know him a little bit. I could have ghosted him. I'm busy. I don't think I'm really interested. But he played on mm -hmm. a comment I had made in our first phone call. You prevent ghosting when you engage them with what they've shared with you. Let's look at time blocking. Time blocking. This is a, I'll tell you what, oh. this is what separates average salespeople from great salespeople. Average salespeople, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, man, I hope I have something to do today. I don't think that happens at all. No, we're incredibly busy. But what happens is we spend our time focused on existing challenges. We spend our time focused on existing customers. Sales managers, if you're watching this, you are, you are guilty, guilty, guilty of this. Because all you do is you harp on your salespeople. Hey, follow up with this customer. Check with this, check with this. So what does it do? It trains your salespeople to be nothing but making sure they're taking care of their existing customers, leaving zero time to prospect. Prospecting, uh, there are too many people that wake up in the morning and say, man, 
I want to prospect first thing this morning if they have an option. You know, if they have an option, what do they do? They take care of everything else, right? Yeah. So you have got to block time. And what I suggest is this, and there's a couple blocking techniques. The amount of time you block is dependent upon your job structure. In other words, I lay out for, when I work this, this exercise through some companies, we will lay out here the five or six critical things that they have to do every week, or maybe eight or nine. I, I just did this with a company, and there were 10 things that the account executives have to do every week. And then what we do is we come back and we begin assigning time. We, we block time. The idea being is that you're going to focus on this Tuesdays between nine and 11. You're going to focus on this. You're going to block and, and you fill your calendar up with your time blocking. And there's something magical about this. Now, you have to be willing to hold yourself accountable. But here's what I found. If I set myself up and let's use prospecting as an example. I'm going to set aside prospecting time. False, wrong, big mistake. Do never set aside prospecting time. Huh. You set aside two types of prospecting time. One is preparing to prospect and the other is actual prospecting. Because you know what will happen if you just have one time? You'll spend all of your time preparing to prospect but never actually picking up the phone. So what I say is this. I'm going to set aside time for here's my prospecting preparation. And here's my prospecting activation. And I set up two separate blocks. If I'm, and I still can't get over this hurdle, what I do is I now set myself objectives. I set myself very specific objectives for each one of these. Now, when you time block, you never time block your full day. Never, ever. You always leave open windows. I, for instance, I time block my entire day. When I get done here, I have a 30 minute window to catch up on other stuff. And then I have a 90 minute period where I'm gonna be working on two key activities. Then I have another 15 minute break and I have another 60 minutes to focus on another activity. You see, these are activities with myself to complete things. It's to complete prospecting projects. It's to complete client projects. But here's what happens if you don't, what happens is your day winds up controlling you. You have to control you. The best salespeople out there do not allow time to control them. They control their time. And I see this happening far too often. Now, let me jump into this last thing. Then we're going to get questions going here because the other thing on the sheet was the window pane. This is a cool strategy. I love the window pane because I'm a visual person. So I'm in sales. Yeah, I, I could never be an accountant. If you look at a window pane, many window panes, they'll have like really nine different panes. You know, you know how they're in a box. And, and what you do is this represents an account. This represents an account. Now, I use the example of nine. You can use an example of six or four or even two. But what this represents is this represents both contacts in key piece of information that you need to learn. So for a large customer, you're trying to penetrate a large customer, you're gonna look at a window pane and your objective is that you're going to hmm, identify nine people that you're gonna be prospecting, nine people. And because it's a window pane from top to bottom, there's gonna be three kind of down towards the lower, three at the mid-level of the company, and three up at the top. And your objective now is that you got that window pane you take another window pane and your objective is to now begin filling in pieces of information that you learn. Boom. And what you're initially gonna have is you're initially gonna have one more window pane for all nine of them. But then what's gonna happen is as you develop relationships, you're now gonna have a window pane per individual person. What does this do? It does a couple things. A, it allows you to begin really listening for that critical need. Remember the difference between a suspect and a prospect? Oh, it also is going to give you critical information that you can use to prevent them ghosting you. Oh, this is also going to give you critical information to work your way up, up the food chain with other people. So what I do is I establish this window pane when I'm prospecting. And depending on the size of the customer, it might be nine window frames. It might be six. It might be four. It might be two. I, I don't know. But 
It's a strategy that allows me to stay focused. Okay. <laughs> we fired through a lot of things and I could fire through a lot more, but we got some questions over here. Yeah. Why don't you kind of read through the questions and let's get some Q and A going here. Okay. Let's do that. I think that's uh, we have, I'm going to go to questions here. Um, should you not show some empathy to gain trust? So Muhammad had a few questions. That was one of his questions. Um, should you, uh, and then he asked, um, can you give some examples of questions that show you are competent? Yes. Okay. I love it. Okay. Empathy. Yes. More than ever right now, we have to show empathy. Integrity, transparency, accountability, and trust are needed more than ever right now in this COVID-19 world that we're in. It really is. And so I do. I, I want to have empathy to listen to your backstory. Everybody has a situation. Everybody has a story between where they were the middle of March, right? When this thing hit and where we're at today. Now, empathy is not sympathy. Empathy is just listening. So I'm going to listen. Now, in order to be a good listener, you may have to share yourself. And that, that, that's okay. Now, let's get into some good questions that, that demonstrate your competence. Here, here are the questions that demonstrate your competence. These are questions what I can ask that are industry specific if they're industry specific. So for instance, Sean, auto close, you, you provide a great email tool. Yep. And so I, I will say I'm prospecting Sean. So I might say, Hey, Sean, what, what are some of the things that you're seeing in terms of open rates, you know, so forth. Now, what, now I may be selling janitorial supplies to Sean's company, or I might be selling, you know, I don't know. But, but if I sit there and ask him a question about that, What's Sean going to sit there and say, this guy understands my business. This guy knows me, you see? So I demonstrate competence by asking questions that are industry specific or relevant to them. Now, Sean, I didn't know this, but you told me earlier that you used to play professional tennis, really kind of cool. So again, I could sit there and, and, I, and I could say, hey, what did you think of the US Open and how they, how they handled that? you know, in terms of the whole COVID situation. And I'm sure you would love to share with me. Now, what is that? What does that tell Sean? Mark understands me. Mark knows my interest. And it's amazing when we demonstrate an interest in the individual, it's amazing how much more competent they will, they will think I am. I'm still just a dummy. I just listen. Yeah. And to be, you know, to, to Mark's point, Anyone that ever messaged me on LinkedIn and sees tennis on my profile and actually asked me a question, I've given, sorry, I've given uh, two, I've had two cold calls with people who just wanted to ask questions about their, their kids playing tennis. So um, it does definitely work because it's worked to me to have, uh, to provide people um, definitely some time. Uh, Lucia, I missed the O in the equation um, and that was opportunity. Yes. That, and, and that's when you put the proposal on the table. The, that, that's because now we know what the, what the value is that you're looking for. Right. Perfect. Uh, and she also asked, uh, oh no, sorry, Lacey, can you give an example of a scenario to get down the three levels? So level one, two, and level three. Sure. Okay. And we're going to, we're going to, Sean is again, our <laughs> guinea pig here today. Thank you for showing up and playing today. So I call Sean up and, um, uh, we'll just say, uh, it's, what, what is it? Something that I, well, I, I don't, I don't care what it is. Sean, Hey, ha, what are you seeing happening with emails in terms of regulatory compliance around Canada and around the U S now yeah. it, it, is that going to generate maybe a response from you? I mean, you'll, you'll get, you'll get a, you'll get a response from me. Yes. If you ask me, but it's know. probably going to be pretty, <laughs> Exactly. Yep. Right. Because, okay, how many times have I been asked this question? Right. <laughs> but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit there and say, hey, that's very interesting. Where do you think it's going to be in a year or two from now? Now, what am I doing? See, I'm now starting to ask your opinion. See, yes. the second level begins to ask your opinion. So then, and so I don't know, Sean, I, I don't know if, you know, we'll say you say something. So, so that's interesting. So you feel that we're going to see really no uniformity in terms of compliance between the EU and Canada and the U S is this, is this kind of what you're seeing? 
And then you might say yes or no, whatever. And like, so now what I know, see, now I've gotten down to three levels because then I'll go. So how big of an issue do you think this is going to be to your business? See now, see, see, I'm, 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 I'm three levels down because I've got Sean zeroed in telling me about his potential business issues a couple of years from now. Uh, Tom has a good question. Um, so he's asking, how do you shift from a bid from like providing the price to value? So how do you provide more value when you're going for a bid? Yeah. Okay. First of all, if you're doing a bid, if you're doing an RFP, anything like that, if you didn't help write it, what are you wasting your time responding to it for? I mean, I, I, I hate to be very, now there are strategic reasons why you might, because you want to get your foot in the door and so forth. What I'm going to do is this, when I'm responding to a bid, what I always do is I may include the price if from a regular, from a governmental issue or something like that, I have to, but I'm always going to put in there a list of other questions. My objective is to get you who is, I'm submitting the bid to, to get thinking, whoa, we didn't think about this. We didn't think about this. We didn't think about this. Now, what does it do? It does two things. It allows you to begin seeing that I'm competent because I'm raising issues, it begins thinking that, hmm, maybe we need to get this person to come in and have a seat at the table. Because when I respond to a bid, when I respond to a bid, the majority of bids, what they're doing is, is they're going to get down to the final two or three, and then they're going to probably review them again. So what I want to do is I just want to get what I call a seat at the table. I want to be in the ballpark to get a seat at the table. I am not going to put out a low price on a bid initially if I at all can avoid it. And again, I, I'm not a fan of bids because my whole thing is if I didn't help write the RFP, if, you know, if I didn't help write the bid, what makes you think I have any ability to get it? Yeah. Perfect. Well, this is an interesting one, guys. And if anyone has, doesn't have the, the mind for sales book, I would definitely get it. This is actually about chapter 21 in your book. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> and the question is, your goal is simple, to be able to spend more time with fewer prospects. Can you elaborate on this a little bit? Yeah. The, this comes back to this whole suspects versus prospects. You see, what I want to do is I really want to qualify fast. I want to, the, 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 there's a couple beliefs that I have. Don't start what you can't finish. I see too many people start off a prospecting campaign with, 10,000 leads or a thousand leads, all this sort of stuff. And well, that's great. That's fine. But do you have the ability to nurture them through? So my, my goal is I may start off with 10,000, but I want to get it down to those 10, those 12 that I'm going to zero in on. And I'm going to love them so much because I'm going to create that maximum value. Think, think of it this way. You walk into a restaurant, and if it's a very busy restaurant, very busy restaurant, and you get seated at a table and you're gonna get, you're gonna get service. Now you walk into a restaurant and there's really only a couple customers there. There's only a couple groups there. Gee, a COVID-19 situation, right? Yeah. And now suddenly the wait staff is all about maximizing the experience because they have more time to love on you. They have more time. So in, in, instead of saying, instead of allowing you to pick the wine, they may suggest the wine. Instead of just allowing you to pick the hors d'oeuvres, they're going to bring a couple hors d'oeuvre trays over to you. What are they doing? They're maximizing the experience. What are they doing? They're actually creating more value for me. Will I pay more? Yeah, <laughs> but it increases my value. Yep. Um, we have another one from John. So, you know, how do you leverage COVID into your prospecting? Uh, it's a great question. I always tell people, embrace it, but uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Mark. Well, first of all, there's nothing we can do about it. So don't lose sleep over it. Now, yes. here, here's what I say. COVID creates a, in fact, I just did a video on this yesterday. Are salespeople needed in a pandemic? Yes, they are. We are needed more than ever right now because there's so much confusion out there. And there is so many decisions being made right now. There are so many buying decisions being made because we've taken 40, 50 years of societal change and compressed it into 18 months. And so you have to be out there. So yes, what it means is this, there's two things that you need to do. A, keep your deal simple. 
don't make things complex because if they got to get four or five different types of people involved, it could take you forever to get them on Zoom. Two, accelerate the process. When the customer says, yeah, let's get back together, don't sit there and say, what's your calendar look like next week? Hey, what's your calendar look like tomorrow morning? Speed the process. I had a situation the other day where I was talking to somebody and uh, the next day I called the person back and they'd been laid off. Yep. Whoa, not good. Yeah, perfect. We're going to take a few more questions, guys. Um, and then, uh, Mark, maybe we'll get a link to how people can get your book yeah. right after that. Uh, but how can you dis distinguish between a real prospect and one that you have no chance to sell? Like, what are the signals you look for um, between a real prospect and one that you might not have a chance to sell? Well, I would say yeah, you have a chance to sell everybody. It's all, it's all in your pitch, right? It is, it is all in your pitch. And, 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 and what I want to do is, I, are they sharing with me a piece of proprietary information? Have they shared with me a piece of proprietary? Inf now, that, that's what I say is number one. In other words, this is that, that really that nugget that I know I can help them with. That's a pain. There's a couple of other pieces, and, and it's more kind of generic. It's more around the kind of the whole band thing. But I'll say this. Am I dealing with, with the buyer? And, and here's the question I ask, and I love asking this question. How have you made decisions like this in the past? Now, that's a non-threatening question. If, if you were to ask, so are you the decision maker? They're going to go get all uptight at you. But if I say, so how have you made decisions like this in the past? And they sit there and say, well, I normally got to take it to so on. Ah, boom. Then what I want to know is what is, the, what is the timeline for them making a decision? Now, the timeline for them making a decision is very much driven by the need that they share with you. What's that critical need? Well, you know, you know, we want to do X. Well, doesn't mean anything. But if it's a critical something that they've got to solve by tomorrow, then whoa. You know, there, there was, I, I was working with a software company. This goes back a few years ago. And, and they were selling, they, they sold to multiple industries. But one industry had some regulatory changes that were about ready to take effect. Well, guess what? Everybody knew that those Every, every company in that industry had to buy the software quickly. And it was either them or the competitors. It was a horse race. Here's one final piece that you want to stop and think about this, though, in terms of suspects versus prospect. If you don't see their outcome lining up to what you normally achieve, to what you normally deliver, don't waste your time on them. This is why I say, Stay in your lane. Know your ICP, your ideal customer profile. And I wrote about this in the book, but re regarding your ICP, you never allow yourself to get more than 30% away from the description of your ICP. Because otherwise, you're just chasing a shiny object. Yep. And we see, I see too many people just chasing shiny objects. Doesn't work. Perfect. Let's go. One more question here from Mark. Uh, I'd like to hear your suggestion on getting past the gatekeeper to reach the decision maker. And I know this is a question that everyone always asks. So uh, I'd love to get your input, Mark. Well, if you read the book, you will notice that I do not call them gatekeepers. They are door openers. There we go. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Rephrase your question. No, no, no. I, I will go ahead and answer. No, no. Here, here's holding. Yeah. Here, here, here's like, first of all, Respect the gatekeeper, door opener, for who they are. They're just doing their job. They're keeping riffraff like you out. What I love to do is this. If they're blocking me, now you can do all the normal routines of, of call a different division, call a different person, call sales. You know, there, There's only two departments in any company that will always pick up. Well, three, security sometimes, uh, you know, if it's an oil refinery. But anyway, it, it's, it, it's going to be sales. And it's going to be accounts receivable. That's it. That's it. Okay. Don't call accounts receivable. You can call sales, but that's a separate piece. Uh, I'll go. Here's the whole thing. Ask the door opener the same strategic question you would ask the customer. If, if, if you were able to get in front of them, you know, if they you know, hey, I'm looking for Sean and they, oh, oh, sorry. No, 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 no. Hey, can you help me with this question? And you just ask them the same question. Now they're not going to be able to answer it and they're going to blow you off. That's fine. I'm going to call him back a couple days later. Hey, try to reach Sean. 
you know, Sean and I had some, we've been exchanging some emails, like to try to connect with him. Boom. Nope, still not. Uh, you know, he, can you help me with this question? Well, you asked that door opener over the course of three or four times, three or four strategic questions. And that door opener is going to look at you and go, I guess I am going to go ahead and put you through. Uh, persistence. It's persistence. Yep. And it's not just persistence. Hi, is Sean there? Hi, is Sean there? Hi, is Sean there? <laughs> no, it's asking a great question. Yeah. Well, Mark, I will tell you that the other Mark that asked the question will no longer call it a uh, gatekeeper because he just received your book yesterday. So he will start reading it. Uh, he wrote in the comments, I just received the book yesterday. So once you read it, Mark, um, you'll actually start calling it um, the doorkeeper. But Mark, the door uh, opener, not the door doorkeeper. Opener. Door, oh, opener. Sean, door opener. Man, you're killing me, man. Um, I will ask you, for everyone else that's here today and that will watch the recording, where can they get the book? The best place to get the book is Amazon or Barnes and Noble or bookstores around the country, you know, if they're open. Uh, but yeah, it's, 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 I suggest jump out to Amazon. It's, it's out there, audible version, hardcover, and the Kindle. Barnes and Noble's got it. Everybody else has got it. It's there for you. Perfect. And we'll also put that, uh, when we send the recording out tomorrow, we'll put a link in there to actually go directly to, to purchase the book for Mark. But Mark, I want to thank you. That was a lot of knowledge in 45 minutes. And I think, uh, with all wow, the we, we, we moved. <laughs> we and, did. And, and, of course, and, and of course the website is the And that was my name. That's, that's my real name. People always say, <laughs> what was your name before you changed it? No, that was my name. Yeah. So. I wasn't, I wasn't Mark finder. <laughs> Well, you guys had the hunter and the finder on today. Um, the hunter was the one doing most of the talking because he has a wealth of knowledge. And I'm so excited that we had him here today. If anyone has any, any questions after, um, feel free to you know, send, send Mark an email, send me an email. We're more than happy to answer them. But we will send you guys the recording with the link to the book. Um, do you have an audio book for this, Marcos? Just ask Mark. I think you said yes. 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 As read by the author. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much again, Mark. And we will have to do a follow-up after everyone here today gets your book, receives it, and reads it. We'll do it again. Great Perfect. selling. Thanks, Mark.